you. Um, it's really an honor to be here. I, um, I get all the code pink um, literature and emails, and I've gone to a couple events in front of the White House and shown up here and there, but I've really never been to this kind of a summit, so it's really an honor to be here. Um, so I'm just going to give you a short history of the divest, invest from fossil fuel movement that I've been involved with. I'm going to say what worked, what were the hurdles, um, and then we can move on. Um, Hopefully, as a, as a summation, some of the things that I put forward you might find useful in the creation and the development expansion of this divestment from a war machine uh, campaign that, that, that um, is getting created. Um, I'll just start by saying that the divest invest from fossil fuels now claims, can claim that it has $5.5 trillion in assets that are committed to be either are or committed to be fossil free and committed to be reinvested as a whole that um, in a new energy economy. <laughs> and that is 700 organizations and 60,000 people have pledged, taken the pledge to divest, invest. So quick history, uh, really started as most things do with university students. Uh, raising hell on campuses and saying to their endowments, we do not want our endowments invested in fossil fuels. So the 350 campaign uh, was doing very well, and then they ran into Harvard. And so uh, I met uh, a head of a foundation named, uh, a woman named um, Ellen Dorsey, and we thought that we could get a, a, a group of foundations um, who would put, the wind, put some wind behind the sails of the student movement. So um, I was hired by Wallace Global Fund, and we got 17 foundations, $1.7 billion in assets to commit to going fossil free, and that was covered because of some good PR um, in the New York Times, front of the business section, and got a, a lot of play. Um, but then, um, in conjunction with the climate march, we um, engaged and uh, the, Rock the Rockefeller Foundation came forward, standard oil money, to divest. And that really went globally. And even in Brazil, a friend called and said, wow, this is really something. So Mark Ruffalo was there. And then cities, you know, the, 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 the students moved not only within their universities, but within cities. Um, then Europeans for Divest Invest came forward, and now 350 is rebooting their fossil free campaign, and I think that's going to be sort of a n era two. I forgot my stopwatch. I'm going to start it late. <laughs> okay, so what worked? Number one, there were some media magnets universities, Harvard, foundations. Ellen loved media. <laughs> so she was very able to engage. Uh, uh, institution and visible support. We, we, we worked hard on branding, um, and so we were able to garner, um, we, didn't, we didn't place a lot of emphasis on social media because we didn't have, uh, the students of course did, but the, the, the philanthropy campaign and the individual campaign. Two, it was actionable by investors. So we didn't say divest from uh, anything or fossil fuels in general. We narrowed it down to a list of 200 oil, gas, and coal companies. And that was really important because we could hand people a list. Look and see if this is in anything that you own, in your 401k, in your mutual fund. Um, so it was clear and obvious. This. Um, we eventually, through fossilfreefunds.org, made it easier for people to, fo to find where to invest without fossil f f funds without fossil fuels. Third, and we're really lucky on this one, um, or not lucky, I mean, it's just true, but it really was in the investor's best financial interest to divest. Because of this, the, the carbon tracker came forward and did a beautiful study for shareholder advocacy, 
on stranded assets, which I'm not going to go deep into, but it's just that the assets on the balance sheet of these top 200 companies were going to become less and less valuable. So therefore, your, if, you, if you own any of this company, your stock is going to become less and less value. It actually, people could see it happen over the three years from 2014, 15, 16 of the campaign. So they experienced a decline in their holdings. Um, and we were able to show graphs that carbon intensive assets underperform market benchmarks. Last, of course, what worked is the moral imperative. Um, people don't know, you know, if, if Al Gore had, instead of in the credits, included his little tiny list of what to do, had put at the very top, divest from fossil fuels in inconvenient truth, it gave people something to do. Um, which brings me to the hurdles. Um, hurdles are, it gives people something to do. Most people don't think of themselves as investors. So we had to, when we launched the individual campaign, we had to explain why, if you have a 401k, you are an investor. And you can go to your HR department and you can say, I don't want my pension in invested in this. So it wasn't just about telling other people how to invest their money. It was ensuring, finding the way to invest, ensure that your money, whether it was $10,000 or $25,000 or $200,000, that, that you could do it. So we had to get over this hurdle of causing people to only see others as investors, not themselves. Um, Another hurdle was um, those individuals, from the individual perspective, who did have high net worth kinds of money, um, they, were, they are just beginning to connect their money with their values and finding ways to find a social return and, and divest from whatever it is that they personally work for to um, to work on as a campaign, but they don't, they're, they're just starting to connect it to money. Um, third hurdle was people didn't know what to invest in. Um, so we began, it was really interesting watching this wave move through the financial industry and as products began coming forward, and, and now m there are more and more index funds and mutual funds that are fossil free. And um, so now it's easier to invest fossil free um, and to invest more proactively. Fourth hurdle was the tension kind of between the financial culture and the activist culture. Um, fifth was coordination and collaboration. Our network of various groups uh, I, I, you know, had good coordination, but it always can be better. And last, uh, the hurdle was this dichotomy between divestment and shareholder activism. Some people thought you could only do one or the other. We thought you could do both. Um, and so, in conclusion, I just really want to applaud you for taking the long-term view. Uh, a, a divestment campaign is not a short-term project. Uh, apartheid took anywhere from how you want to measure it, 8 to 12 years. Um, the divestment campaign is really just sort of in the fourth year, um, but it is a it is a powerful meme and message, and it causes it gives people it gives people it empowers them to recognize that not only do they have their voice, um, but they have their pocketbook and what they buy, but also what they invest in and what the, what we all those associated with this, the universities that we go to, et cetera, that that is what makes the difference in this economy. Thank you.